Thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here in calling and talk about the more practical way how we handle rotator cuff lesions, impingement, frozen shoulder, uh, based on the uh, national um, Danish guidelines. I will talk a little bit about the practical way we treat the patients in our department. I will start up with impingement, talk frozen shoulder, and a little bit about uh, rotator cuff surgery, even though there have been very prominent speakers today and yesterday, I will try to do uh, my best. Two words about myself. I'm head of the shoulder and elbow uh, section uh, surgery at Herleo Gentofte Hospital. And we are six consultants there doing only shoulder and elbow surgery and six junior consultants. A little bit about the work we do and the amount of surgeries we do on shoulder and elbow every year. The shoulder anatomy, I won't say much about it. You're all very familiar with the very complex anatomy of the uh, muscles uh, aimed at, at uh, moving the shoulder and uh, the very uh, prominent rotator cuff anatomy. You have probably talked a lot about that uh, uh, all day yesterday and also today. But again, you know, of course, we have the subscapularis in front, the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus. We have the coracromial ligament and the roof in the shoulder, so to say. The biceps tendon is also an intimate part of the rotator cuff, and we will talk a lot about it. You also know what the rotator cuff do. It centers the humeral head in the glenoid socket through several uh, major balanced uh, forces. What happens during life? I call it rotator cuff biomechanics aging. What happens in life? Well, this is a young shoulder uh, where you have an intact cuff. You have sufficient of room, but the deltoid have an imminent uh, effect on the, uh, on the humeral head. It drags it upward, and what the cuff actually does is centralizing your humeral head on the cavities. During age, some patients, we don't know why some patients have these problems and others do not, it, the, the humeral head will uh, tend to go upwards. It will give pressure on the uh, rotator cuff, and ultimately we will have a core, core chromial arc hypertrophy and we will have uh, rotator cuff lesions. As I say, we don't know which patients will develop this, but we know that a certain amount of patients do it through life. What are the uh, things that we can see? Well, the first thing in this process is development of bursitis in this area. Then we have bony impingement due to osteophytes on the uh, acromion, on the lateral clavicle, uh, extending to osteoarthrosis of the acromioclavicular joint, ending up in a rotator cuff tears. How does the patient present in our clinic with impingement? They are often middle-aged plus, 45 plus. Females more often than males, they have a slow onset, usually no trauma, can't sleep on affected site, they have pain at abduction, positive impingement tests, force usually unaffected, and they have a pain relief after a supercromial blockade. I noticed the discussion you had before, and uh, maybe it's not common practice in Denmark to give a supercromial blockade, but I will say still it's a very good way to get the patient started up with physiotherapy if they are very much uh, painful in the beginning. It can, away, it can be a way to start up the training. How should you examine your patient? Well, you have to examine where do they have their pain, how is their range of mo motion? Do they have the painful arc syndrome, as you can see it here? Do they have impingement signs, the Hawkins test, the NEARS tests? You have to uh, examine sulcus sign, especially in younger patients who have impingement pains. They usually have another disease. They have some kind of laxity in their shoulder, so do the, the, the sulcus sign. Examine lax signs. Uh, is a, a, a normal force over the shoulder, you have to examine that, and you have to examine the AC joint if that's a part of the disease. When you examine your patient, it's always important to take off their clothes, see how the, uh, the, the shoulder blade moves on the uh, uh, backside of the chest. Many of the patients I see in my, patient, in my clinic, uh, I think they have not have taken their clothes off because nobody has seen what actually happens in these patients. It's important to take the clothes off, inspect them from the front, inspect them from the back, and see how the, uh, the shoulder blade moves on the thorax. It's extremely important. You know it, all of you here, but not all uh, common practitioners as doctors in Denmark maybe know this thing. 
you can examine them with x-ray. We do uh, traditional x-ray, uh, front view, a side view, and we do the outlet view to see the undersurface of the acromion. It was uh, graded by NEA in three uh, types. Type 1, which is a very flat one, the curved type 2, and the more, uh, uh, even more curved type 3, as you can see it here, with calcifications in the core coacromial uh, ligament. The treatment, well, you have talked a lot about it, conservative treatment always in the beginning, physiotherapy, use a blockade, I think it's extremely important to get the patients moving, and if physiotherapy and conservative treatment doesn't do the trick, you have the possibility with a supercromial decompression. In our hands, this is a scope of the shoulder, a bursectomy where we remove the bursa supercromiale. We plan the acromion to a type 1, as you can see it here and here, and we resect the coacromial ligament in order to be able to plan the undersurface of the acromion. What about AC resection? How often should that be done? Well, it demands that you have osteophytes on the undersurface of the joint, that you have an X-ray that shows you the arthrosis, and that there is direct and indirect pain over the joint. And in my hands also, I want to see that the patients have pain relief when I inject a blockade into the joint. The resection can surgically be done either all arthroscopic or via what is my impression at least, uh, many surgeons do it with a mini-open technique, but you can do it all arthroscopic or you can do it mini-open. I started mini-open and now more and more I do it arthroscopic, but I would lie if I said I never do it with a mini-open technique. The after treatment, uh, bandage for the first few days, and then we focus on mobilizing training. We have heard a lot about how they should be trained today, and I won't go into that. But uh, we uh, tend to uh, uh, strength, do strength training and, stab and stabilization of the scapula. We take all our patients after surgical treatment to a three-month control. And when we talk about the sick leave, I say to the patients, it's all dependent on how work demanding, uh, how shoulder demanding their work is. If they're working in an office, maybe one, two weeks. If they have any uh, hard labor, I think it's important to give them six to eight weeks out of work because it can be extremely difficult for them to come back and back again and say that they need more and more time. It's better to say it from the beginning, it will take six to eight weeks. What are the complications after surgery? Well, the lack of effect in these patients, up to 20% have no effect of the surgery we, we, we give them. Some people develop a chronic pain syndrome. It is relatively rare. More often is that they develop a frozen shoulder. It can be difficult to uh, see the difference between a frozen shoulder and a chronic pain syndrome. And I think there's a big, uh, I think often there's a misunderstanding of what it is, it is exactly the patient's presents. And I think many patients with frozen shoulder actually are announced to have a complex a pain syndrome of their upper extremity. Infection is very rare and uh, problems with the AC joint, if you haven't resected the AC joint, is not uh, very rare. Nerve damage due to the scalenos block can be, uh, it is very, very rare, but in a clinic where we do some decompressions, working in the patient's insurance agency, I have seen more nerve damages than I would expect from the numbers I see in publications on how many nerve damages in, is inflicted due to the scalenos block. But I think Anna Katrina will come back to that. What are the results? This is an old study. I have brought it because they have a very long follow-up, 12 to 15 years, 31 arthroscopic, 29 open. Good results after arthroscopic decompression, a little better after the arthroscopic than after the open procedures. And more studies have shown exactly the same, that the patients obtain almost the same result, but when you do it arthroscopic, they have a quicker return to work. This is a Danish study, I think we should mention, Lars Konradsen, Klaus Hjort Jensen published last year in Danish Medical Journal, arthroscopic supercromial decompression results at two years using the VORC score. They had 80 patients, 94% completed uh, the, the follow-up more males than females, relative young age, and here we can see the effect of the Danish uh, guidelines, more than six months classical symptoms of impingement with conservative treatment with physiotherapy before uh, surgery is performed. Surgery, the classical uh, uh, type, AC resection in less than half, 
two years follow-up, and they could see that uh, the work pre the walk preoperative score was pretty high. It was pretty low at the follow-up, and 79% had improvements. They defined a success rate at two years of 72%, 79 at three months, and there was no difference between three months and two years. So relative good results. What about frozen shoulder or periatrosis uh, humoscapularis? Well, this is shoulder stiffness. It can be primary idiopathic, as we see it in some patients, or it can be a secondary frozen uh, shoulder secondary to a trauma, to other causes as arthrosis, rheumatoid arthritis, impingements, etc., and we can see it following surgery. It affects during a lifetime 1 to 2% of the population, and when it has a post-traumatic debut, this is often a little delayed uh, to the trauma uh, with description of symptoms after one to two months. If we have diabetes, there's a five-fold increase in the risk, and again, as in many other things here in life, females more often than males. The frozen shoulder presents in three stages. There's the acute to subacute inflammatory phase with severe pain. Motion increases pain. It lasts up to six months. The contracture phase with increasing global range of motion handicap, various pains gradually decreases. It lasts also six months, up to six months, and then we have the resorption phase where pain is recovered and uh, range of motion increases to near normal. Uh, in, in my clinic, and if you look in the literature, uh, the patient doesn't achieve completely uh, normal uh, motion after a frozen shoulder. So the natural history of this condition is between 12 to 24 months. Especially the group from the Exeter Clinic in Great Britain around Tim Bunker have uh, done a lot of research on frozen shoulders, and their conclusion is that the etiology of the disease is still relatively unknown. Uh, autoimmune causes were suggested, and uh, histologically uh, fibrosis was described. When we do surgery in these cases, in arthroscopy, it's difficult to approach the joint. The capsule is tight and severe. A synovitis in the anterior capsule makes the surgery difficult uh, due to often there's a very bad overview of the joint. In these situations, it can be uh, difficult to enter uh, the joint. So how do we uh, put the diagnosis uh, on the table? Well, there's a classical debut. It comes little by little. They have severe pain. There's a high tendency that the patients have uh, diabetes. There can be trauma, but remember when there is a trauma, often there's a debut relative late in, in, the, uh, in the course of the disease. Examine and be aware of the globally restricted range of motion in uh, impingement. You do not have uh, affected external or internal rotation, but in a frozen shoulder, uh, rotation is severely affected. If you take an x-ray uh, relative late in the course, you can see osteopenia on your x-ray. And on uh, MRI, you can always see that the capsule is, is uh, diminished significantly. You can see it on this view. And you can also see it when you go down through the joint. You can see the anterior capsule is diminished. That often you can see that the ligaments looks a little thicker than you would expect. What is important for your diagnosis is also that you exclude other specific causes uh, for this disease. How should it be treated? Well, you can treat it conservative, then it will follow its natural course. You can do physiotherapy, and there's a lot of publications on physiotherapy. I'll come back to that. There's a lot of discussion on should we do physiotherapy or not, and I can say I wrote this article, I wrote an article in 2006, and I think it's the article I have had the most response of. I have mails every day from patients who have read this very, very small article I did in 2005 about frozen shoulder, and most of the mails I receive are from desperate patients with desperate pain. You can do uh, hydrodilatation, as described by Bookbender in 2004, or you can do corticosteroid injections or do it peroral as they do, uh, especially in Germany, or you can do an arthroscopic release. When you consider the surgery, there's no, until now, no randomized control studies showing the effect of what we actually do. If we look at the conservative treatment, uh, Rockwood in his book from 2004 described 93% restitution of shoulder range of motion within 18 months and inferior results in diabetes. If we look at physiotherapy, there's this systematic Cochrane review from 2000 and 
13, they said there was no documented effect, and I'm sure all of you will say afterwards, that's not true what I'm saying, but I just say it's out there, 2013, no documented effect. They suggest gentle neglect, or what they call pain relief. Hydrodilatation, described by Bookbinder, showed a very short, uh, where they simply uh, pushed a lot of water into the joint that dilatated the joint to break the adhesions. They found an improvement af after six weeks, but this was not maintained over time. Again, when you use corticosteroid, be aware it gives you a small, short-term benefit, but the benefit doesn't last if you look in the literature. So we are back to conservative treatment or arthroscopic release. There has been a Danish study from 98. They showed a norm normalization of range of motion in 75% of their patients within the first nine weeks. There have been other results relative uh, successful. This one from Berg and co-authors 2004, 84% success after 14 months. Maybe it's the natural cause of the disease. I don't know it. We, we lack randomized controlled studies to see the effect of the surgery uh, so that we can give to the patients in this situation. At Haleo Hospital, this is our approach. We do conservative uh, treatment for the first 12 months, light physiotherapy, an occasional uh, corticosteroid injection if the patients are desperate, but we tend not to do it. And after, if they still have symptoms, if there's no signs of improvement after 12 months, we do an arthroscopic release, beach chair position, stage procedure as shown down here. I won't go through it. It's pretty much uh, straightforward. Uh, what about rotator cuff uh, injuries? They can be either. What is important in rotator cuff injuries is to know, is it a traumatic injury or is it an atraumatic or degenerative injury? It has a certain effect on the treatment we are going to give. And I'll just go back to this slide again. I think it's a fantastic slide. Shows what happens naturally in life. And these degenerative cough uh, lesions in older patients probably shouldn't be treated uh, that much surgically. We also know that small complete rotator cuff tears, they may heal, as anna Katrina have shown in her study some years ago, or they might pro progress to larger tears. And how do the patient present? Now it is suddenly all ages, often there's a sudden onset. The younger usually have a trauma, the elderly have no or a minimal trauma. I have had patients who opened a, a shelf or they opened the oven door and then they had the injury. And of course they can't have a rotator cuff lesion unless they have a, a degenerative translated uh, rotator cuff. But again, they try to, 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 to find a trauma that could explain their symptoms, and almost all patients do that. They can't sleep at the affected site. They have pain ab abduction, positive impingement test, forces affected, and the pain relief from the block is sometimes unsure. When you do your x-ray, consider superchromial fragments, as you see it here. Consider the acromiohumeral distance. Here it's normal. Here you can see it's, it's very tight, it's very narrow. The head is high rising and there's arthrosis. This is a rotator cuff arthropathy uh, patient, classical. What about ultrasound? I always bring this slide, not because of this nice young woman, but because it is an ongoing discussion and I think also anna Katrine will come back to it. The problem with ultrasound is that it is cheap, it is easy. Many of us do it, it is a fast way to see it, but the problem is the specificity which is very, very much observer dependent. The patient, the, the person who do the ultrasound has to be very experienced to, 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 to draw the right conclusions on their uh, ultrasound examination. We think, I think that MRI is more uh, secure to do. Of course, it is more difficult to obtain an MRI. It is more expensive. But what you can do with an MRI is that you can see the quality of your muscle. You can see the extension of your uh, rotator cuff defect, and you can see uh, also on the MRI the high-rising uh, caput. I think it's a little bit more secure. I have had the problem in the patient insurance when I went out to the X-ray experts and said, well, we have this ultrasound saying that there's no rotator cuff deficit, but one month later, there's suddenly a very big rotator cuff deficit. 
And the X-ray experts said, well, we can't say anything about this ultrasound. And therefore, I think it's a very unsecure examination. And I'm sure there's a lot of persons here who would be completely disagree with what I say here. But, but it's a fact when you, when you sit in, in the legal end of the, uh, then there is, there is a problem. How does it look? This is an arthroscopy of a patient who have a weakness in abduction. And uh, when we come in with the scope, you can see that there is uh, something going on in this joint. There's a reddening of the uh, anterior part of the capsule in the interval. Uh, it could almost look as if it was a little frozen, this shoulder. But this can be a, a, an effect of bleeding in the joint also. And when you follow the biceps tendon, you can see a normal subscap and you can see uh, the, the partial uh, supraspinatus tear on the undersurface. How do we size the cuff tears? Well, a minor tear is up to one tendon, moderate tears up to two tendons, and major tears is when you have more than two tendons. Again, it's an ongoing discussion what to do in certain situations. I think when there's more than two tendons involved, it can be pretty impossible to recreate at least in a degenerative cuff, to recreate any function in that shoulder. It's another case if it's an acute traumatic injury in a young individual. Minor tears, we do arthroscopic or with mini-open technique. Uh, up to two tendon tears uh, in my clinic, usually we do it with open technique, but it can be done arthroscopic as well. And uh, when we have the very big tendons, especially in the older patients, we consider them irreparable, and we consider in that situation to do a latissimus dorsi transfer. Not that we do that many latissimus dorsi transfers. Last year we did four latissimus dorsi transfers in our clinic, so it's not a common thing to do, but it's a good thing to have in the, in the, in the armamentarium, so to say. The post-operative treatment, we use uh, 14 days of immobilization in a metella, and in weak cuff or large reconstruction, uh, sometimes up to four or six weeks of immobilization, followed by passive mobilization in our physiotherapy. We do it as specialized training with increasing uh, loading to full weight-bearing weight after six to 12 weeks, uh, according to the pathology we have operated. Training is focused, as you know, on stabilization of scapula and mobilization of the joint. And if we have worked on the subscap, we avoid uh, external rotation for the first six weeks uh, over neutral. What is the results after uh, mini open rotator cuff repair? Again, I have taken this study from 2013 from Simon Bell from Australia because he had a very long time follow up. 49 shoulders, age at follow up means 70 years and with a mean follow-up of 15.6 years, meaning it was pretty young patients he operated on. At surgery, eight large, four medium tears, and one small tear. And at final follow-up, using the UCLA as a prompt uh, score, there was 34 excellent, a good result, seven fair, and eight poor. He observed furthermore that between two and 15 years, the results deteriorated in 15, but they improved in 24. So more or less, uh, not a big difference between two and 15 years. 84% of, of the patients were satisfied at the final follow-up after medium 15 years. Coming back to the National Clinic uh, guidelines that we published in 2013, uh, talking about treatment of impingement, rotator cuff problems, and also to a certain extent about a frozen shoulder. The background for this uh, uh, national Danish guideline was that the regions in Denmark observed a rise in the amount of operated shoulders operated for degenerative uh, shoulder diseases, impingement, rotator cuff. And there was this unexplained regional uh, difference in the capital region where I'm from. We uh, operated the least, and in other regions they operated three times as much as we did in the capital region. At that time, it was thought it was due to private hospitals because there was an increase, increased use of private hospitals in this, this period, but it turned out to be that this was not correct. There was this regional difference uh, which, had no, uh, um, which has nothing to do with the use of private hospitals. Coming to the recommendations of the intensive uh, uh, scientific work we did, we went through, I can't remember how many publications we went through, it was a an, an fantastic hard job to go through all these 
scientific documentations about what to do in certain situations. We, st we ended up with relative weak recommendations because the science out there is not very strong. I have to say that. But we uh, uh, recommend that when you examine a patient for impingement, you have to do a minimum of a Hawkins test, a nearest clinical test for impingement, and the painful arc syndrome. You have to describe the painful arc. These three tests is a minimum when you examine your patient for impingement. We also think it's good clinical practice that you evaluate the strength of the shoulder muscles, the, uh, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and subscapularis. And we also think it's good clinical practice to do an injection of a local anesthetics to see if this relieves the pain of the patient. Coming to x-ray, uh, patients with uh, continued shoulder pain should, as a minimum, have a conventional x-ray. This is uh, recommended as good clinical practice. And when we suspect a cough lesion, we should use either MRI or ultrasound. Ultrasound, preferentially when the examiner is experienced and well-educated in performing the ultrasound. If the examiner can't say that, you should tend to use an MRI. So for putting up the diagnosis of impingement, you need a positive Hawkins test, positive near test, positive pain arch, normal power over the joint, and a relief of symptoms after injection of, a, uh, of lidocaine or another uh, local anesthetic. You have, of course, to exclude other causes as fracture, rotator cuff lesion, uh, uh, oncologic diseases, and other causes for your shoulder pain. If you want to put up the diagnosis of a complete rotator cuff rupture, it, came, it demands the same examinations as before, uh, diminished power over the shoulder joint, and an ultrasound or MRI verified lesion of uh, your shoulder. When it comes to non-surgical treatment in impingement and degenerative rotator cuff, it is uh, highly recommended to use training as a part of your treatment of your patients, and it is uh, considered good clinical practice that the duration of the training is not less than three months. Uh, it is considered good clinical practice if the patients have a lot of pain to use supercromial glucocorticoid injection uh, in order to, to start up the training. And again, uh, if you have to use other painkillers, you have to consider the problems that can adhere to these painkillers, as for example, NSAID. And finally, it can be, uh, uh, it can be suggested to, to use manual treatment in your, um, in your training of your patients. So surgical treatment of impingement is first a treatment offer when other non-surgical treatment option has been tried in a, a proper period. Does that mean that we have to wait three months before we treat all our patients? No, not necessarily. But it means that if we want to treat them before they have tried three months of training, we have to argue why this specific patient should not have three months training before we do our surgery. It is a clinical decision and we have to argue in our papers why we do it differently. So it is not impossible, but you have to argue why you do it. And I can say, we can certainly see at my clinic that following these national guidelines, almost all of our patients are treated around three months. They have had blockades, they have pain treatment when they come to our clinic. And I think it's a great help in the daily clinical practice. If they haven't had it, we send them back to the physiotherapist and ask them to train the patient eventually with a, a blockade. If this doesn't help, we offer them an arthroscopic supercromial decompression. We don't do it open because the uh, science shows that when we do it with arthroscopic technique, they can return a little bit quicker uh, to work. It is not that the quality of the treatment are different. It doesn't look that way when you look at the literature. With a rotator cuff uh, uh, lesions on a degenerative basis in elderly patients, they should be treated uh, with training. Uh, they should be treated non-surgically. And if you want to uh, surgically treat them, if the cuff is repairable, it is an option. But again, you have to consider how is the quality of the tissue you are going to reinsert. Many of these patients are better treated as impingement patients. 
both based on the literature and also, I have to say, on my personal experience, which is probably not very valuable. With a traumatic rotator cuff rupture with the young patients, where there's a possibility for surgical reconstruction, and we have to write this because I also see patients 35 years of age where there's no surgical possibility to reconstruct the cuff. And in those instances, we have to consider other options as, for example, a latissimus dorsi transfer. But this group should never be uh, put up for training. When they have a traumatic induced rotator cuff uh, lesion, they should be treated surgically and uh, within three months in order to be able to reconstruct the cuff. So quick surgery in the young patients with rotator cuff lesions, you can use either open or closed technique. The result seems to be equal. When you have the, last, uh, when you have the large uh, cuff tears, you see the superior mi migration of the uh, humeral head with supercromial pain and instability. And in those instances, especially in little younger patients, a possibility can be to do a latissimus dorsi transfer. Here you see the latissimus muscle released and reimplanted on top of the uh, humeral head. You can see it here in a, in a drawing. And if we look at the results, this is Christian Gerber's results published in 2013. 57 shoulders, more males than females, relatively young patients, long follow-up. And what he observed was a constant improve from 56 to 80 points. It was significant, a very good improvement. The simple shoulder value improved significantly and pain score improved significantly. Whereas motion didn't improve very much. The patients continued to have relatively bad motion. In our clinic, what I tell my patients is they can probably achieve motion uh, to 90 degrees. I have never seen patients that had uh, much more motion than that. So relative good improvement in pain, a constant score and simple shoulder value, but range of motion probably a little less. How does they look when they turn up with their cough arthropathy? They look like this woman or this man here. When we see the x-rays, they look like this. Here you see an MRI of the same, and some of them have a Milwaukee shoulder with these uh, uh, things on their AC joint. This is... Uh, uh, um, this is filled with fluid, and I have many of these patients received from rheumatoid uh, doctors who have tended to uh, take out the, the fluid and try to do it again and again and again. And the problem is, at the end, these patients end up with infection in their shoulder, and I strongly recommend that nobody tries to remove this fluid because it is impossible. They need uh, a surgical treatment if you're going to solve the problem. You can try to solve it with a traditional shoulder implant, like in this case. And if you try to solve uh, this situation with this implant, you will have what this woman have. She have an anterior superior escape of a humeral head because she is not able to center the humeral head on the cape. It says the only uh, straightforward treatment you can offer these patients are a, a reverse prosthesis. In this instance, a delta. Not all of my patients look like this, but I see results like this with the delta more often than you should, should suspect. Here is uh, results reported in 2013 in relatively young patients, again with a long follow-up. There's a lot of publications with short follow-up, and I think what we need to know is what is the long-term results. 46 reverse shoulders, relatively young patients, constant score improvement, very high. Forward flexion significantly increased. But again, complications in 15 shoulders or 37.5%. Six failures with three infections, three loosenings with removal or conversion to hemi. So you have to consider with this kind of surgery, it gives significant complications, but the majority of the complications can be handled without removal of the implant. This is the Danish results for primary reverse and cough arthropathy from the Danish shoulder arthroplasty registry for this period. There was 575 procedures. The patients was a little older than in the publication from before, more females than males. We had no systematic preoperative WUS, but normally when it is published, it is in this area. We saw WUS at one year of 70%, and there was revisions 
in the first year, within the first year with the reverse implant of 6%, which is a high amount of revisions. You have to consider that. This is the post our postoperative treatment following a shoulder arthroplasty, again 14 days of immobilization, followed by passive mobilization with, in with increasing loading to full weight bearing after six uh, uh, weeks. We avoid force in external rotation in the first six weeks, especially when we have implanted uh, a shoulder implant due to a fracture. So soon you are finished with listening to me, so I'll just summarize what I said. Impingement patients should be offered training. If they have severe pain, do a blockade or do peroral pain treatment in order to accommodate the training. They have to train at least three months. If they do not train three months before you consider surgery, you have to argue why you do it in this specific uh, situation. If, they do not, uh, uh, if you do not relieve their symptoms by training, you should offer them surgery. You should offer them arthroscopic surgery. And in cases with AC arthrosis, I at least recommend, and Klaus Short and Lars Konradsen recommend, to remove the AC joint. In my hands, this has improved my results following decompressive surgery significantly. Traumatic cough ruptures with younger patients with, uh, uh, with the diminished uh, force should be operated quickly. Degenerative and atraumatic cough ruptures should be treated as impingement. And frozen shoulder should initially be treated with maybe light physiotherapy, pain relief, and with persistent stiffness and arthroscopic release. Thank you. Well, I will continue with the backside then. So the Danish Painish Patient Compensation Association may be familiar to some of you, but maybe not that much to others. So I will also tell you a little about how the organization is, is run. So the compensation uh, organization decides on compensation claims for patients injured in connection to treatment in the Danish health care service. So, so to speak, iatrogenic injuries. Uh, the uh, company used to be called the Patient Forsikring, but changed names a few years ago to Patient Erstatning. And uh, this was related to that the old name led to misunderstanding, as this is, of course, not a health insurance in the common sense. The organization is a private mixed uh, public uh, company, and it's fina financed uh, by the regions and the Ministry for Health. So the administration by both of these, and the regions pays the, um, uh, the um, treatment injuries and the ministry pays for the compensation for drug-related injuries. It's run by a board of eight members and the, Danish, uh, the daily um, management is uh, run by the director and two deputy directors. And we have a larger office in Copenhagen and a new office also in Odense. The average processing time in, in 2014 was about around 200 days, and this has been decreasing over the years. But the processing time is also sometimes waiting for the patients to have the final result of their treatment, so it probably cannot get that much lower. In 2014, just less than 11,000 claims were handled, and. Uh, out of these, 470 were drug-related. This was an 11% raise from the year before, but actually the compensation that would pay that year, which was uh, 766 million kroners, was slightly decreasing compared to the year before. In average, 30% uh, of the cases are recognized, and uh, if the um, case is rejected, the patient has the possibility to appeal, and around 14% of the appeal cases are later reversed. So if we look into the annual reports, um, the providers, oh sorry, the providers, if you look in the upper part here, you can see that the public hospitals are the uh, the um, are the uh, 
sort of provider in more than 70% of the cases. The GP doctors around 10% and the private hospitals and specialist doctors around 10%. And then as, of course the other providers in the healthcare has um, also some cases, but there are actually rather few. Here you see the physiotherapist, um, the chiropractors and so on. If we look at the bottom, you can see that there are more cases than actually number of persons that are, are claiming. And this is because some of the cases involves more than one provider. So there's uh, more than one case per person. Uh, so what are the reasons for recognized and rejected claims? Well, if the, you look at the upper part here, you will see that around 20% of the cases are uh, recognized due to sort of ap uh, uh, not optimal treatment or diagnosis and 10% are, uh, just less than 10% is recognized because uh, the patient has an injury due to a severe and rare complication. If we look at the rejected cases uh, most are rejected because they, they actually uh, don't um, meet the requirements for the compensation or there is an injury that is too small to get compensation and the lower limit is 10,000 kroner. So what kind of uh, compensation does a patient get? Well, as you see here, it's split up in, in what the, and this is the, um, the, or, uh, the, the, uh, the, um, the, um, the lawyers that actually decides on, on uh, the size of the compensation here. So we give compensation for lost earning capacity and continued disability, loss of income, and then also if the, uh, the case has a prolonged treatment period due to an insufficient treatment, then they also get for pain and suffering. And the fundament for the compensation is the Danish Act on the right to complain and receive compensation within the health service. And I will not take you through all this boring law stuff, but uh, just uh, take a few, few points out of the paragraph 20, which gives us an idea of what kind of injuries that are entitling patients to compensation. So the uh, paragraph 20, um, chapter one, we call it the specialist rule. So it comes to play if it may be assumed that an experienced specialist in the field in question would in the given circumstances have acted differently. And this during examination treatment or the like, and thereby avoiding an injury. The other one is the, uh, uh, the chapter four, we call it the complication rule. So if an injury occurs as the result of examination, diagnostic procedures, treatments in form of an infection or other complication that are more extensive than the patient should reasonably endure. And of course, we have to look at uh, the patient itself uh, the severity of the injury and, of course, the general state of health. And also we look at the unusualness of the injury and the risk of its occurrence. So an example of a case that is uh, just by the specialist rule, we, uh, I've taken this uh, case, a 44-year-old female, she's healthy. She fell on an icy pavement last year in January and she had an injury to her right shoulder. Um, she went to the casualty ward and the examination there was actually as it should be done. And uh, also according to the um, recommendations that we just saw, she was scheduled for an evaluation after 14 days and this is perfectly okay. She came back, <coughs> unfortunately the uh, doctor there didn't do that much and he uh, I think he sent her for rehab she came back first of March she still had shoulder pain she still couldn't raise her arm above uh, horizontal and the doctor gave her a steroid injection and you can probably sort of figure out how this ends 
she came back end of May. Uh, this is the first time that uh, the uh, journal described a proper clinical examination and the doctor had a suspicion of supraspinatus tear. He, this was confirmed at MRI. And she had surgery done a little later on, end of August. She had uh, two tendon rotator cuff full thickness tear involving the front of the um, supraspinatus and half of the infraspinatus. And the surgeon said it was quite difficult to repair the tendon. So in this case, um, Treatment of a full thickness rotator cuff injury in a healthy 44-year-old female. Surgery was performed eight months after the injury. And for the uh, patient compensation claim, the assessment was that both the diagnosis and the treatment was unnecessarily delayed, which is not best practice, also according to the recommendations. Uh, and then we have to look into what would it have been if she had surgery at the right time? And the expected uh, disability is around 4 to 8% for rotator cuff injury, even if it's stitched right away. And in this case, she still couldn't raise her arm above uh, horizontal, so she was, uh, had a disability around 10%. So uh, she probably would have had a better result if she was treated early on, and this gave her the compensation of 68,000 kroner. What about the frozen shoulder? You told us a bit about it. Um, I've actually um, been lacking evidence for the uh, risk of a frozen shoulder after even simple shoulder arthroscopy, but I was very happy to see that this summer this very nice study was published in the UK, and it actually says there's a risk of about 5% after simple arthroscopic shoulder surgery. But most of the patients will recover and regain normal range of motions, but of course it takes longer. So if the final result after treatment is still severe restricted range of motion when they had the rehab, and it's about one and a half year after, of course, some of the patients may still be sort of um, able to be get compensation because this is even more than they should expect. So it's an unusual complication. What about the rotator cuff repair and frozen shoulder? Well, almost, well, I haven't seen any studies where stiffness is not reported over 5%. So this is a common event in after rotator cuff repair. Uh, there are some risk factors for uh, having more stiffness after rotator cuff repair. And it's, it's very nice when people actually have noted in the journal how stiff the shoulders are before they do the surgery. Um, calcify <laughs> calcifying tendinitis, uh, uh, a little surprisingly, sin single tendon tendon repair is apparently associated with more stiffness than uh, more tendons involved. And younger patients, and of course the ever-lasting worker compensation patients have less good results. Uh, the good thing is that the patients complaining of stiffness actually have as good a healing rate of their tendons. So I always tell that to the patients that come with stiffness after rotator cuff. We know it's annoying, but you should know it's still a sign that the tendon is still sitting on. So, so that's a good, good point. They should be encouraged to continue their training. I've, this is about rotator cuff. So um, I'll just tell you that all the cases in the Patient Compensation Association are filed in a database at the end of the processing with a diagnose and also the diagnose of the actual claim and the hospital and so on. And I've um, extracted cases that were related to traumatic rotator cuff injuries. And I've been looking at the uh, last seven years and uh, in this period, the total number of cases in the database is uh, 62,000 patients claims. And if we look at the rotator cuff injuries, 
with the diagnosed code DS46, uh, which is the traumatic rotator cuff tears. Um, we have 674 cases. And I've also looked at what uh, was the claim issue. And out of these 193 of the cases, the claim was a missed diagnosis. So this is rather quick, and, and we will come back to that. Uh, the rotator cuff claims uh, here listed by years um, are increasing, and the number, total number of cases, uh, cases are increasing, but the rotator cuff cases are increasing even more. The number here is not uh, complete, yes, because most of the files are not, uh, the cases are not processed yes, yet. Um, so what are the primary diagnoses? Well, of course, the rotator cuff injury, but actually 40% were diagnosed primarily with a dislocated shoulder, then some distortion and also contusion. And because the uh, diagnose cause also include bison tendon injuries. This is, of course, also a part of the primary diagnosis. If we look at the first complaint diagnosis, we come back to the missed diagnosis. And then uh, we also um, file them as uh, not satisfied patients if we don't find any injuries because they have filed a claim. Uh, Delayed surgery or treatment, insufficient surgery or treatment, deep infection, no complication. And then uh, we also have some numbers of nerve lesion. And I will not come through. I've um, run these together. And overall, uh, the claims have 43 uh, kind of different nerve injury claims three reflex dystrophia, which we would, of course, today call uh, complex regional pain syndrome, one arterial lesion, 25 deep infections, and then also three cases of cerebral thrombosis and apoplexias. But these are the claims. These are not the accepted cases, and these were actually not accepted as a complication to the surgery. So to look at the accepted cases, uh, this is 80% of the claims actually have misdiagnosis, which is very, so this is the problem with the rotator cuff cases in Denmark. We miss the diagnosis. And uh, of course, uh, these also include delayed treatment. And then seven cases are actually approved for stiffness. Uh, tendon rupture, I, um, I haven't looked more into these. And three of the uh, complex regional pain syndromes are accepted. Uh, five infection, and this is something you, you remember, there was 25 cases with infection, but only five has been accepted. And this is, of course, because we need, they are only accepted if they are severe infections. Two nerve injuries, and then a few others. The highest compensation, uh, the, the lowest is 500 kroner, and, and you may wonder, this is because it's split in the to health providers. So, of course, the patient still the least is 10,000. The highest number of compens uh, the highest compensations is more than 4 million paid to a young woman because she had a missed cancer diagnosis for four years. She was primarily diagnosed with a biceps uh, injury. Um, I know we are a bit late, but we also started a bit um, late, so I hope you will um, continue for, I just have a few cases and then we are stopping. Uh, this is a case of a 45 year old, a 55 year old male, uh, auto mechanic, shoulder pain, MRI showed a partial supraspinatus tear, probably a degenerative kind, he had no injury. Uh, he had initially correctly conservative treatment, later on he had a subacromial decompression, he filed a claim because he, after four months, had restricted motion. And uh, of course, uh, he did get no compensation uh, because uh, the treatment was done correctly. And the complication is a frozen shoulder, which is too, too frequent to get a compensation. Another case from 2008, 52-year-old female. She had an 
injury in April, fell, uh, hit her right shoulder, uh, decreased range of motion, pain. She went to the GP doctor who said, wait and see. But he saw her again after 14 days, which is considered correctly. And he sent her correctly to the orthopedic department. Uh, for some reason, the, um, uh, the uh, diagnostics were quite delayed. She had an MRI which showed a large rotator cuff tear. She was referred for surgery, but also due to summer and so on, this was delayed. And she eventually went to a private hospital and had a five centimeter wide uh, tear involving three tendons. So in her case, uh, the diagnosis and the treatment was unnecessarily delayed and uh, she had increased disability and she had actually quite a high compensation compared to the average uh, 800,000 kroner due to especially loss of uh, <laughs> working capacity. 59-year-old um, male, uh, half-year shoulder pain, previous surgery in the other shoulder. He had a uh, supraspinatus tendon here on MRI, and in 2010, he had surgery in the beach, beach chair position. He didn't have any no nerve block. But after the surgery, he experienced severe pain in the shoulder, radiating down the arm to the first and second finger, gradually increasing. And he also had sensibility disturbances. So there was a, a um, suspicion of a plexus, brachial plexus lesion, and this was actually confirmed through an EMG. Uh, apparently, the nerve lesion sort of uh, went uh, improved, but he still had a neuropathic pain and was diagnosed with uh, chronic regional pain syndrome, uh, even had a depression too. So uh, in his case, uh, it, this was considered a rare and severe complication. We don't really know the reason. It could be stretching of the plexus, but of course it could also be a um, the CRPS usually develops not, in, uh, not immediately, but delayed after typically two, three months. So, but the initial nerve injury, we don't know why he had that. But uh, he had compensation, of course. I would emphasize that it's also quite important that we generalize neuropathic symptoms prior to surgery and treatment, even in the physio and ergotherapist and the chiropractors, because we get cases where patients later on complain that the physio did something and then a nerve gets stuck in my shoulder. So please write these symptoms. Then the cases are very simple. It's the primary disease and not your treatment that has done the fault. Um, so some considerations. Patients have high expectations, which of course is good, but some of the cases are clearly because of loss of uh, that the patient didn't get the improvement that they wanted. And this is especially the case for the impingement patients that uh, try to claim if they don't get better, it has something to do with the treatment. Uh, and I also believe that it's very important that we generalize that the patient should be involved in the decision. And of course, we have the issue about the uh, degenerative changes. We have talked about this. I will not come more to it. <laughs> the uh, thing that I will emphasize is that in some of these cases, the patients file a claim because somebody told them, ah, if you had only come earlier, if if, I, if you had seen me before and all such thing, and the old doctor is a stupid one, and you know, people are told lots of things. And if that case is not improved, we have a very dissatisfied patient. And, and I don't think you help the patients by saying this. It's much better if you do the proper journalize, and then, then we will be happy. And you will have a happy patient as well. Yeah. So again, in Denmark, the most problem with rotator cuff cases is that we miss the diagnosis. 
and I think it's improving. I think the new numbers will become better and also after recommendation. So thank you. Yeah, I don't know if anybody has a quick question, otherwise I think we will uh, continue with the um, coffee break. Thank you. <laughs>